Hawkeye Dank has been pretty active over the last while. Sure has. Uh, looks like we're in. Right. I haven't seen it yet, but I'll transition us live. There it is. All righty. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. This is the... Q&A portion for exploiting key space vulnerabilities in the physical world. Your main goon here is going to be pasties. This is fallible. And uh, thank you, Bill Graydon, for coming to join us today. Yeah. Bill, could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Bill, as you know. Um, I've, this is my second DEF CON. Um, I actually started out last year as both a main track speaker and a village lead, um, founding and running the Lock Bypass Village, which I'm uh, helping out with this year as well in the online forum. Um, in my non-hacker life, um, I work for a company called GGR Security, uh, doing physical security um, consulting, audits, and a number of related services in that regard. So sort of the, the very flashy aspect of that job that uh, is, is highly applicable to the DEF CON environment is physical penetration tests, um, with which some of these things that I talk about fit into. Excellent. Uh, just catching so, on. Go ahead. Yeah, we're seeing a couple questions come in right now. Um, there, well, we have one, one question about, uh, have you ever worked, have you ever created a bump key? Another one is uh, your opinions on the disk style locks. Um, so some, some general questions about different types of locks right now. Um, you're welcome to take a stab at those and we'll wait for a few more uh, sure. talks to come in. So uh, in terms of creating the bump key, um, I created hundreds, possibly thousands of them. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean that video that we showed at the, or that I showed at the very start of my talk with how keys actually get originated, all you have to do to make a bump key is that cutter wheel that's taking a bite out of the key at particular positions, you just take that all the way down to the bottom position and then some, um, and you do that across all of the spaces, and uh, and that'll do it for you. Um, so yeah, I, I've absolutely done that for both regular uh, systems as well as high security ones like uh, Medico. Um, so uh, sort of along the lines with your with your talk, um, when you got to the point where you were like narrowing it down to like the last like 10 or 18 keys, is it possible to make like a targeted bump key that would just be more effective uh, at just like dealing with all of those all at once? That is an incredible question. Um, and the answer is absolutely yes. Um, what a targeted bump key would look like is effectively the lowest cuts that are present in any of those keys in your narrow down key space. Um, and so in fact, this is something that's been known to locksmiths for, for decades, um, actually the, the possibility to do something like that. So I didn't have time to talk about, well, a lot of this in, in the talk, but one aspect is I talked a bit about how you want your grandmaster key to be one cut in the highest position so that none of the change keys under it can be filed down. You also, in many cases, want it to have one cut in the lowest position. And the reason for that is if there's any of your change keys that are lower than your master key in all positions, then that change key will act as a bump key that will work in every lock on that system and can possibly be jiggled around and bump those pins all up to the master shear lines. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's a great question, and that's that's how you do it. Cool. And uh, the the next question, which I, I kind of interrupted there, was, uh, what what are your opinions are on uh, disk style locks? Uh, apparently, storage locations hate them because they actually have to be cut off. Disk detainer type locks. Um, yeah, so, I'm uh, yeah. So I'm I'm looking at, at this question now. I'm not entirely sure what it means with how they have to be cut off. Um, in terms of a storage location, like if, if someone needs their locks removed, mm -hmm. um, I guess what the question is getting at is that maybe locksmiths are able to pick the other types of locks, but not the disc container locks. Mm -hmm. That effectively comes down to the skill level of a locksmith. I mean, disc container locks can be picked just like any others. Um, they're a, a much more specialized skill set to do, and they require more specialized tools to do. Uh, and, and the good ones are are harder, um, you know, so if you got an Abloy project on there, it's like there's been no verified documented picking uh, success with those. So in that case, then yeah, cutting them off is, is your only 
the only option, which for an app like Protec is also going to be a hellish of a job. Um, but so I'm not entirely sure what the question is getting at, but I, I, I think that I think uh, I think that pretty well covers it. Yeah, more than likely. So. Um, uh, I always enjoy when uh, people come and give us more of the in-depth side of the physical security stuff for uh, DEF CON talks, and I appreciate you coming in and presenting that material. Um, so um, as you're going through, you are explaining things from a bypass direction, at least a lot more bypass this year, right? You, you're not approaching things from the uh, lock picking side. So how did you find yourself in the direction of the bypass instead of uh, um, what seems to be more in vogue with the hacking community of the um, single pin picking? Uh, that's a great question. So with, I mean, with bypass, it's the sort of thing that in, in my anecdotal experience, at least there's a lot less uh, literature out there about those particular techniques. You know, you, you've got a whole bunch of great talks at various conferences um, about them, but nothing super formalized. And there's a lot in that field that really is yet to be discovered or potentially yet to be published. Um, since, as uh, as I mentioned in, in some of my other talks with Bypass Village, um, lock bypassing has traditionally been the domain of criminals and of uh, of classified materials, both of which tend not to get um, published. And even, I mean, locksmiths as well do it, but for, I mean, even still, the locksmithing industry is a very kind of tight um, tribal knowledge, apprenticeship-based type industry where they don't, um, they don't publish that sort of thing. And so that's, I think, a large part of why the hacker community has not gotten into it nearly as much lately, or until lately. Um, but from a personal perspective as well, like I have, never be in a very good lock picker. I understand the theory inside and out, but I just can't do it. Um, and that's in a large part because of a fine motor disability that I have. So it's like, you know, I got to go find something else that uh, takes a bit more core skills. Um, and so lock bypass is part of that. And then having uh, founded and, and run the lock bypass village, just like you jump headlong into it, you can't get out <laughs> once you're running a village. <laughs> I can totally understand that. So what's your, what's your everyday carry kit look like? Good question. Um, I mean, I am incredibly disorganized, so to, to think that I have an everyday carry kit is uh, is a bit of uh, <laughs> um, gratuitous to me. But um, you know, if if I'm anticipating needing to potentially get through a door, it's like, well, in that case, I'm, I'm carrying a, a much larger kit than what would be everyday carry. Um, if I'm anticipating, well, maybe needing it, but probably not. Um, you know, I, I might have um, a, a rake and a tension wrench, real simple. That's all the, the picking equipment um, for poking the latch out of the way. Um, so like a, a shove knife for, for latch bypass. What I've got on my key ring is, is a little wire that's just a, an L-shaped end of wire that I can whip out and, um, and, and, and do that on any block that I might encounter. So, so I've got that. Um, and, and really, that's about it. Like, I, I don't carry a whole lot else with me. And I find that in many cases, um, if you can't improvise, it's it's not worth taking that particular approach in an everyday situation. So, I know there's a lot of discussion in the community, at least in the lock picking community, of most of what, you, what we do for fun as lock sporters isn't all that practical in your uh, out in the world trying to be a locksmith. Um, at least from what I've heard, and I'm, maybe you'll uh, either confirm this or uh, um, tear this down, but if you are, if, if you're faced with a lock, it's usually going to be easier to attack the mechanism that holds, it, holds the door together or you know, get in through a window or et cetera. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, a large part of it is sort of not just hacking, but ethical hacking. It's like if, if our goal is to get into a facility, well, there, we're sort of balancing a number of, of objectives here. How much do we care about how long it takes us to get in? How much do we care about the damage that we do, the noise that we make, the forensic evidence that we leave behind, et cetera? So you kind of pick and choose your techniques based on that. And then, of course, there's a cost element. There's a skill element. So it's pretty multidimensional in that regard. Um, and the vast majority of practical cases, so what we see in security consulting, 
is um, you're, you're protecting against forcible, you're protecting against very, very, very basic bypasses, um, and that's about it, and that's what your threat model is. Um, and so I think in, in some regard, the focus of the hacker community on ethical hacking has done somewhat a disservice for the blue team because they are protecting against the wrong threat model. Um, and so, so you see you see that a lot um, with with the forcible entry being really downplayed in terms of its its impact on physical security. I, I like that as a thought. That's really interesting of uh, talking about um, training the blue team maybe to not it. The, the things that people in the outside world are going to hit you with might not be the same things that we as the hobbyists are going to hit you with. So, um, do you have like something, some like a specific example of like something that is more realistic in the real world that a blue team might encounter as far as physical security protection goes that isn't like normally tested or advocated for in this, these kind of talks, that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, if you, um, you know, let, let's take a, a simple example. You're a mom and pop shop and you want to protect your store. Um, if if you go to, like, you know, many, many police departments will, will do a very simple free security audit for you. Um, and they know very well what the threat model is. And so they're recommending things like bars on the windows. Um, you know, if you go and, and ask many people in the hacker community to do a security audit, they're, they're not going to think about things like that. They're, they're going to try to, you know, use use a, a fancy latch thumb thumb turn bypass tool on on the door and say, OK, you got to patch that up. And and they might try some sort of um, electronic attack on your access control system. And it's like, well, that sure is a vulnerability. But uh, the sort of people that have the, the means and, and the motivation and the skill to perform those are not going to be breaking into their neighborhood <laughs> mom and pop. So, right. Um, Ma matching the attacker to the threat model. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got a, a question. Um, have you notified any security desks about uh, the vulnerability of having their keys visible? Um, can you say the start the first part again? Have I, have uh, I notified them? Yeah, has, has it been like a, an actionable report or, or just like informed them like, like hey, you, you've got your security keys on your ring and I can see them and that's a problem. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's one of the standard things we check for with, uh, with any security audit. Um, the biggest time that we see this is with uh, multi-unit residential. You know, if you've got a concierge desk, we leave that lying out. And it's a really simple human factors thing, right? So you just create, you know, put a little box there that they can put it in that shields it from public view. Mm -hmm. And that little box then can be self-locking. So if they have to walk away and, uh, and and handle something that's not then left out there for for anyone to see or take or whatnot, and, and we've seen some pretty egregious cases of uh, of that being breached when you don't have good human factor design in that regard. Mm -hmm. So you, you're uh, the so, okay. So first off, uh, the the tool that you work, showed off throughout the entirety of your talk um, is that already uh, available? Is that is that something that that other people can see and use? Yes, it is. Yeah, so that's uh, online at a number of links that I've uh, posted in my talk. So you can find the source code on my GitHub, um, the Graydon and uh, and tinyurl.com slash key dash space will will link you to a version that you can run right in your web browser. That, that's awesome. Uh, so we can uh, share that in the uh, track one channel here at the end if that's yeah. uh, cool with everybody. Yeah. So that's a good uh, idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with that tool, like, uh, like it starts out with a, a, a pretty brute force approach and you start adding on these, these layers of knowledge. Um, there was uh, a lot of pieces of knowledge. Is that something that you like, uh, already, you just like picked up for, through your experience or is this just like, uh, you just like aggressively compiled all this information from everyone that you knew just to, to put this tool together? It's a great question. Um, I, I'd say that a lot of it is um, a lot of its experience just talking to people, the sort of thing that, uh, that again, that kind of tribal knowledge that exists in, in locksmithing communities, for instance. You know, so we um, we're we're fairly good friends with a number of locksmiths, and so we we chat with them about all sorts of stuff like this, and uh, and get information there. And then a lot of it, when you kind of crunch the numbers and understand the mathematics behind. How keying systems actually operate. Um, at that point, you can you can formally model them with a number of mathematical constructs, and from that, 
these rules become a corollary of that. So a lot of it can be uh, can be derived independently. Um, and so, for instance, the, uh, the the right amplification attack, right? So we derive that independently and then determine that actually this has been published about before as well, um, and it's been known at the locksmithing community. So it's the sort of thing that a lot of people have have thought about, but hasn't until relatively recently been published widely. Um, and to my knowledge, it's the first time that there's a, a computational tool for analyzing it. That's awesome. Uh, so we've got uh, another question. Um, have you had any experience with working with life locks at any military contractor facilities? Um, the answer is is no. I, I I will actually ask for clarification on what uh, what is a life lock. I I don't know either. Uh, yeah, Hawk, Hawkeye, Hawkeye Dank, if you're if you're still watching, we're, we you've got us all intrigued what a, a life lock is. Uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll bump back to your your tool a little bit. Uh, while we're waiting to to hear back from Hawkeye, um, uh, so I I, for, I totally blanked on my question. Fal, you got me. <laughs> no, you're good. So um, there, your talk is quite long, and thank you for that. And and actually, if anybody is uh, out there looking forward to watching this, uh, he was or someone was nice enough to go through and nicely index all of the timestamps on that. Oh, wow. um, so yeah, that was me. <laughs> that was you. You went to that effort. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, th there was some. Um, you mentioned some code books in there, and I I get the impression there were some uh, legal, possibly ethical implications of having that information available. Could you talk to that a little bit of uh, uh, any solutions that you're working on on uh, trying to to make that more accessible? Absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, as far as code books are concerned, I mean, there's hundreds, well, there's thousands of them out there. there there's hundreds that are common to see examples of in the wild. Um, you know, everything from, I mean, any any standard key system that has generally numbers associated with it. So you might have heard of um, common keys like 1284X. Well, that's part of a, a series. 0151X, which you looked at in a talk, is another part of that series. And then there's 1,700 others in it. Um, C415A, so there's your national uh, cabinet keying set. There's about 600 in the A series, as well as there's a B and a C. Um, and there's hundreds of others like that. Um, Medico non-mastered systems have code books as well. Um, so this is a lot of data that's being compiled by a number of, uh, of services out there, the most well-known of, of which is Instacode. Um, so anyone that's looking for that information on a case-by-case -case basis can get a subscription to that and uh, and look up, you know, what, what is C4-15A, well, what's the bidding of that? Um, you can't download the entire data set for that. We happen to have the entire data set. Um, it's not licensed in a manner that we can then release it freely, um, unfortunately. So what one thing that I'm toying with to make that actually happen is create sort of a crowdsourced um, uh, platform so people can, if they have access to that information in a way that they're not constrained by the license, mm -hmm. they can upload it and uh, and then we can create a compendium of that, as well as I'm gonna be adding back into the app a way to import that data if you happen to have it through whatever reason uh, or whatever source, and then you can analyze it that way. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a workaround for that, but could, at the time, yeah, go ahead. Just just like spitballing, could that kind of like crowdsourcing be uh, happen at like a finer grade level? Like I have this style of key, it's got this numeric thing on it, and here's the bidding thing, could that just, be crowdsourced that way instead of you know fully wholesaling uploading the the book it absolutely could be um that is a little bit trickier when you you intersect that with doing the analysis with this software because now it's like if i have a photo of a key that i think is in this series and i say i want to limit my key space to only what's in that series if i don't have a complete series i'm going to get a wrong answer there um, so it does create a bit of a challenge with that, which is why um, there's there's value in that information that the code book you've uploaded mm -hmm. is complete. Um, but for someone that just wants to do a task like look up a particular uh, indirect bidding code to get the direct one, that would absolutely be valuable for that. Cool. Uh, so we, cool. Hawkeye did get back to us. Uh, a life lock is a uh, fail secure combo lock. It can be spun to keep any further attempts from to open occurring. 
Interesting. So yeah, it, it, is it the sort of thing where you, you can spin it to permanently disable lock if something's happening? Or that, um, that sounds like exactly what it is. Um, that's a that's a cool concept. I I'm not. Uh, I, I haven't actually worked on any of those before. Um, I'm, I'm interested to look it up and see if there's any fun analytics we can do with that. So, Hawkeye, if you uh, have any examples of these that you would like to talk further about, this would be a good opportunity to uh, send some messages over to Bill and DM, and maybe there's some uh, interesting uh, future research at, at play there. Which is yeah. actually probably a good question to go to. Uh, what is your next, what's your future research? Where are you going next with this project? That's a great question. Um, so there, there's a number of dimensions of that research, one of which is applying these general methodologies to combination locks. Um, so a lot of the same thing can be used if you can get, you know, any little bit of information out of, say, a safe dial. Um, so very, very skilled people can listen to the clicks and determine what that means. Can we use a computer to, uh, to make that accessible to a wider audience? Um, that's, that's something that I'm currently working on and uh, will be submitting to DEF CON in future years once that's complete. Right. Um, another dimension is tying it into um, the, the talk that I gave last year about key ways and the, the shape of the keys. Um, and so we can combine those two and really get a good sense of, um, from a photo, being able to disambiguate that. And, and so tying those two, two pieces in um, as well. Cool. That's awesome. Hawkeye okay, uh, came back to mention that uh, he's seen them, but is not able to show pics because of... Uh, Policy being yeah, policy discouraging that, which is probably expected. Yeah. So um, you you will share all of your uh, contact if contact information um, so people can reach out to you. I'm assuming, and you are active in some of the other communities here. Would you tell us a little bit about the Lock Bypass uh, Village and um, some of what you do over there? Yeah, for sure. So as I mentioned, last year was our first year at, uh, at DEF CON, and so we had a whole bunch of little doors, um, two feet tall, that had different types of hardware within them. Um, we had a car door there and um, sort of some, some components from elevators, some uh, components from interphone intercom systems that people could then try and do these uh, physical security hacks on. Um, and, you know, we were packed right up to fire code the entire time. People really loved doing that. Um, and so, so this year, of course, with safe mode, what we've done is taken what we could and made online games for it. Um, so you can you can go online uh, to bypassvillage.org. You can practice rewiring alarms to disable them at the comms line. You can practice using UV ink to uh, to bypass combination locks. Practice using shove knives to to disable latches on doors. A whole bunch of other stuff that uh, that we've got little mini games for. So you can that's, you know we've that's focused really on a really cool. village. Well, that's really I crashed cool. the village last year and I loved what I saw. The one thing that I I don't know if I just missed it or if it wasn't there. If you can add something about the magnetic door locking things that uh, I, I would love to see somebody. So. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we're planning to have a, a whole big exhibit on that this year, and then uh, and then Ronnie B happens, so that will absolutely be there for you to see next year. Oh, yeah, I look forward to it. <laughs> was there was there anything that you uh, you felt like you uh, like just couldn't fit into your talk? Some some piece of your tool or something else that you wanted to go over that was just like fascinating for you, but just got the cut. Uh, oh my gosh, there was so much. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I did the initial talk and thought, oh man, an hour 45, this is great. I can cover everything. And then uh, I had to cut it down for three hours. So, um, <laughs> so I mean, one, one interesting thing that um, those who are mathematically inclined will be interested to play around with is there's a separate related tool that will take, if you have a system of locks, you know what their shear lines are, it'll generate a relationship graph for all the different low level keys, master keys, and the top level master for which key will work in, in which lock. And you get some really neat um, uh, emergent mathematical properties from that um, using different different mastering systems. So that's something that uh, is up on my GitHub right now. 
um, I will send a link as soon as I can hop over to the uh, track one talk page. Yeah. I'll send a link to a, an active version you could play with. Um, so that that's one 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 of many things. Yeah. Did Did you use that to generate like a a, a key diagram in your talk at one point? Because there was there was like a grandmaster master like key like tree effect. So that one was. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that that one was not auto generated. That uh, the auto generated ones are not nearly as well behaved um, as, <laughs> okay. as what I showed in the talk. I manually made that one, um, but you know what the auto generated ones look like is what one thing to consider is with with keying hierarchies. It's like if I do the mastering on you know pins one two three four and five, if I have a master in pin three four five, like in the example that I showed, that's why it's a typical um, sub master key would look like. I could also put a master in pins one and two and then change keys in pins three, four, and five. And so now I have a, a, a master key that's going to work on selectively some locks in the A and the B and the C system and not others. And so you actually have this n dimensional um, tesseract that's created from. Uh, from, from doing up master keys in that regard. And and there's another type of system called rotating constant system that creates incredibly complex uh, um, relationship graphs there. That's absolutely yeah. awesome. <laughs> we are right that. almost out of time. I love the question that Panopticon just qu asked though, would you consider posting the director's cut version of your talk? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually gave a thought to that. I, I think what I'll do is, uh, is is break it up into bite-sized pieces and post a number of separate videos talking about the different elements that I didn't get uh, time to, to discuss in the main talk. Um, and so that's, I just created a whole bunch of social media when this talk was accepted. Like, I should probably make a Twitter, so I made that. <laughs> made a, um, a YouTube channel as well, so that's the Burton Liam channel that uh, that's been commenting on my my talk there. Um, that's for me and my brother. We're uh, Robert and William, but uh, uh, Will Burton Liam. That's also a valid uh, shorthand for that. So um, take a look at that. And whenever I have time, after all the chaos of DefCon calms down, I'll be uh, posting some bite-sized videos to there. Awesome. Well, thank you for doing our QA session. Thank you for doing such a fantastic talk. Um, hope to see you again next year. <laughs> Yep. Thank you there. so much. Um, yeah, there, there's a plenty more that we all want to hear from you. So uh, uh, for anybody who would like to know more, it sounds like you can uh, track Bill down in the Lock Bypass Village. Um, and there's more information over there for you to learn as well. So thank you very much. And yeah. um, I'll be I'll be lurking in the Q&A page or chat for the next few minutes as well. So perfect. All right. Excellent. All right. Cheers. Thank you Cheers. so much.